welcome everyone. Uh, my name is James Hall. I'm uh, one of the founding partners and winemaker at Patson Hall Winery. Uh, we're sitting in Sonoma at our beautiful tasting salon and we have what I think could be one of the best days of the year. It's absolutely glorious here, mid 70s, the sun is out, the vineyards are doing really well, everyone's happy here. The only thing missing is you all. So uh, since you can't be here with us, we're hoping that we can bring some of our Sonoma Salon uh, hospitality to you all over uh, the internet. So what we'd like to do um, is have a question and answer flow to this. So if you have any questions you want to send to me, there's a little uh, question mark button in the lower right hand side. Click on that, post a question, we'll pick it up here and I'll try to get to as many questions as possible. But. Um, what I'm hoping we can do is uh, taste through a few wines, uh, discuss a little bit about the history of Batson Hall, some of the winemaking philosophy, um, what's happening in the vineyards, but of course also plenty of time for questions. So um, we are 32 years old as a wine company. Uh, the four partners formed the winery back in 1988 and we had this crazy idea that we were going to make Burgundy style Chardonnay. And we went out looking for the best possible grapes we could find, uh, and we found some very cool climate Chardonnay that reacted well to barrel fermentations and malolactic fermentation, and of course bottling unfiltered, and that launched Patson Hall. We now only make two varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but we make a lot of different bottlings. So uh, since our belief is in single vineyard wines and very special family-owned sites, we bottle 22 individual wines. So um, I hope some of you have had a chance to taste those. Uh, we're gonna go through four wines here today, but you know, it doesn't really matter if you have uh, a particular wine or even if you're not drinking wine, hopefully you can join along and at least have a little virtual sip with us. So um, maybe an update about what's going on in the vineyard. Um, on a day like this, it's hard not to walk through the vineyard and see things growing. You can almost watch the shoots as they're pushing um, what looked like a very early vintage um, with our remarkably warm January has slowed down a lot. So where the growers were really scratching their heads about what kind of vintage it was going to be and potentially worrying about frost damage because the buds were coming out, things have reverted to a very normal schedule, which is a big relief um, because of course the sooner the growing season starts, the sooner we pick grapes. And with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir particularly, we like to pick our grapes as late as possible during the cool fall weather as opposed to August. So uh, I must say that the vintage is looking quite nice. We've had some rain that's really helped grow the cover crop. So um, things are looking up in the vineyard. Um, and of course, everyone is still working very hard uh, since uh, growing grapes is an essential task. Uh, it's still all hands on deck. So. Um, Let's see, shall we taste a few wines? Um, you got any questions at all? Yeah, we got one, James. Um, you know, when things are normal, uh, how often are you out in the vineyards? Ah, uh, so here at Patson Hall, we do not own any vineyards except the one behind me. So we depend on independent family growers. Uh, all of the grapes we purchase are farmed by small independent farmers. And we have long-term relationships with these people. Um, generally, they are either uh, multi-generational farming families or they hire a professional farm company to farm for them. So I try to go to the vineyards every couple of weeks during uh, the key parts of the year. And then of course around harvest, try to go two or three times a week. So um, there's a lot of time on the road, a lot of time visiting vineyards, um, and a lot of it is spent talking to growers about what they're seeing, what strategies we're going to adapt to uh, the vineyard this year, because every growing season has a little wrinkle or two, and so it's very important that everyone be on the same page, particularly about when to do specific operations. So it's one of my favorite parts. I get to drive around Sonoma and look at beautiful vineyards. So um, for those of you that are just joining us um, now, my name is James Hall. I'm the winemaker at Patson Hall and welcome to our virtual wine tasting. So um, since we're tasting, let's get to it. So I have four wines here and I thought we would start with our Sonoma Coast Chardonnay. So um, Sonoma Coast Chardonnay is a very important wine for us because it involves 17 vineyards growing around the Sonoma area, mostly from 
uh, Russian River, but also some down here uh, closer to our tasting salon in Sonoma Valley. And so this wine is very much made in the philosophy of Patson Hall. It's about finding uh, low yielding, cool climate Chardonnay vineyards that are grown with impeccable uh, viticulture. Um, we then thin the fruit in the vineyard and select only the best clusters when we pick it. Uh, and then of course, barrel fermented. Um, all of our wines are aged in 100% French oak. Uh, this wine is approximately 30% new French oak barrels. Uh, but we use very special barrels. Uh, they're only made in Burgundy, and so they're a special shape that's uh, unique to Burgundy. But also the trees have grown very, very slowly, so we try to pick wood that is from the coldest, slowest growing forest in France. So part of that uh, exercise is to have oak that marries and integrates into the wine. So I think it's a really good example of how the oak supports the wine and doesn't dominate. And so, um, I'm tasting the 2017, but maybe you have other, other wines, but the winemaking is very consistent. Um, one of my philosophies is that I prefer to use as little winemaking as possible and try to keep the winemaking as consistent between each of the wines. So if you taste two different Patson Hall wines side by side and they're different, it's, they're different because of the vineyards. It's not some sort of winemaking magic that I'm doing. I'm very consistent between the wines. And so that includes our Sonoma Coast, which is our introductory wine. Um, it is made with the exact same barrels, the same techniques, uh, all the same processes that we use for our most expensive wines. So I'm just gonna take a little sip. Wow. What I like about this wine is it's a very clear expression of Sonoma Coast. As you get closer to the Pacific Ocean, uh, the climate gets much cooler. And so Sonoma Coast is an ABA inside of the western part of Sonoma, and it has a profound influence from the air off of the ocean. And this wine has this real bright, juicy, mineral, acidic quality that I associate with that, that marine air. Um, it goes really well with food. Um, one of my favorite pairings with this actually is shrimp risotto, super easy to make. You make essentially scampi and then the risotto, it's fabulous. The acidity of this cuts through some of that fattiness of the shrimp, you get the spiciness, lovely. So, hmm, it's also a little bit green, which is a great sign for ageability. These wines age really well. Those of you that have put some of my wines into your cellar know that uh, the ageability is, is quite high. Um, a lot of people, um, I think rightfully don't age California Chardonnay because it's really generally meant to be drunk quite early in, in uh, its life cycle. These wines with their uh, strong viticulture and very minimal winemaking do very well in the cellar, particularly if you have um, a good, well-chilled cellar. So uh, don't be afraid of putting it away for a few years. They really round and soften and gain a lot of complexity. So, um, James, you got a question from, from Sopan. Yeah. Does knowledge or experience matter when tasting wines? Mm. Yes and no. Um, I think there's something very emotional and visceral about tasting a wine. You don't need to know much about wine or anything at all to gain some pleasure uh, because wine really is about pleasure. Um, and you don't need to know much about wine to know if you like it or dislike it. Where I think um, having some wine experience comes in handy is that it's possible to add some depth and texture to the wine um, that you're drinking if you know the region and you know something about vintages and uh, maybe something about the winery and how the wines are made. That extra information feeds into the experience and I think can make it much more rewarding. It's a little bit like going to uh, a museum and knowing something about the painter that you're seeing. It just adds another dimension. So um, let's go to the next wine. So the, um, from the Sonoma coast, I wanna take you to one of my favorite vineyards in Sonoma, which is Dutton Ranch. Um, the Duttons are one of our oldest um, grape growing partners. Um, the Duttons are fifth generation farming family in Sonoma. Um, and they've become the Chardonnay masters of Western Sonoma. Um, they have some of the best vineyard sites and 
Um, the Steve and Joe Dutton grew up on the farm growing Chardonnay. They're true masters. Um, and I'm very fortunate that when we met the Duttons back in 1997, um, they agreed to sell Chardonnay to two young punks, Donald Pats and James Hall. And um, they charged us a little more than they did the rest of the people at Sonoma, but we were thrilled to get the grapes. And it's still one of our most important wines. So uh, I'm pouring the 2017 here, but um, I'm sure if you've ever had the Dutton Ranch, you'll, you'll uh, understand some of the descriptors. Um, first of all, the, the grapes are grown in some of the coldest area of Russian River, Green Valley. So um, the soils tend to be very sandy, uh, a type of soil called Gold Ridge Series Sandy Loam, which is a real mouthful, but basically they're very porous, uh, low vigor soils that produce limited uh, crops of grapes. So that does a couple of things. One, since it's so cold, you can't have a lot of fruit and get it fully ripe. So the restricted yield really helps develop flavors and quality. Um, the other thing about uh, those sites is they produce very high acidity. And so that minerality and that, that refreshing cleansing quality um, adds a real sort of beam of purity through the middle of the wine that I just love. Um, the Duttons are also quite famous for growing some Chardonnay that is very, very tropical and aromatic in style. Um, not well known in Europe, um, where people, uh, and Burgundy in particular, do not have the, the proper climate conditions to ripen these really tropical clones of Chardonnay, but California is perfect. And so the Dutton Ranch often has this real sort of white flower, narcissus, uh, juicy kind of peachy note on top which is uh, partially derived from these super fruity selections of Chardonnay, which the Dutton specialize in. So again, this wine is barrel fermented uh, in 100% French oak, 100% uh, malolactic fermented and bottled without filtration. So um, real artisan uh, wine. And, um, and just a little hint of smoke, sort of like a distant campfire where it's just a little tiny waft so it acts as a little counterpoint to the, to the fruitiness. And the Duttons are so much fun to hang out with. They, uh, they always throw a good lunch party. <laughs> wow, I like that. Hmm. I, will, I might have to drink more of this later. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorites. So hopefully um, you've all had a chance to try one of the Dutton Ranch bottlings in the past. And, um, the Duttons also are some of the um, first people in Sonoma to plant Chardonnay, which is kind of interesting. Um, sh everyone knows about Chardonnay. It's the largest varietal in the country, the most popular wine. Uh, almost 27% of all the wine drunk in America is Chardonnay, which is a mind-boggling number. But uh, back in the 60s, uh, there was less than 300 acres of Chardonnay. Uh, Warren Dutton, the patriarch of the Dutton clan, uh, took a chance and planted Chardonnay in 1967 in one of the coldest areas, Grayton of Sonoma. And so uh, not only does he look like a genius now, but he's proven that you can grow great Chardonnay in some of the coldest areas of Sonoma. So uh, hats off to Warren Dutton. And, James, uh, we got a question. Yeah. You're saying that the Dutton is unfiltered. What about the Sonoma Coast Chardonnay? Sonoma Coast is filtered. Um, and that's uh, because there's so many vineyards and it is our largest production. And that wine literally circles the earth. Um, so we need to be a little extra careful with that. The others um, uh, we target to very limited retail and on-premise and direct to the consumer. So um, we're able to take a few more chances with that one. Cool. So any more questions, love to answer questions. Uh, just hit the little question mark in the lower right hand side and fire them over. And Ben here will field questions, and um, we'll, uh, we'll get to them. So, um, time to change gears into Pinot Noir. So, um, Pinot is my all-time favorite red wine. Um, it's also one of the most challenging to grow and the most challenging to produce. Um, Pinot evolved in Northern Europe and Burgundy. Um, and it's so far north in Europe that the, um, the growing season is extremely truncated. Uh, and Pinot Noir evolved to uh, thrive in these very marginal, cool climates. 
Um, when you try to grow Pinot Noir in areas that are too warm, um, the grapes don't really survive with real Pinot character. Uh, the acidity is burned out of them and there's not a lot of color and they lack um, a lot of varietal character. So one of the issues of growing uh, Pinot Noir in California is you need to plant it in the coolest areas. So the Sonoma Coast fortunately has the very cold Pacific Ocean, which feeds the cold air and fog through these vineyards, which allow us to grow Pinot Noir. We have one of the longest growing seasons of any Pinot Noir region in the world. We start quite early, this year even earlier than, than normal. But what we have is every day, with very few exceptions, uh, the cold air off the Pacific starts in the afternoon and we have this big fog bank that comes in and bathes the area in very cool, um, cold air. And so that persists overnight and then during the morning when the fog is burned off, um, it heats back up. So that difference between the nighttime temperature and the daytime temperature is called the diurnal shift. And it's very important for Pinot Noir to have a nice, firm difference between the morning and the afternoon. So Sonoma is perfect for it. Um, and uh, this wine, the Sonoma Coast, is 18 small family vineyards. Um, people like the Duttons, uh, Gap's Crown, Jenkins Ranch, uh, John Catalini, uh, Durrell Vineyards, Parmalee Hill. Um, a lot of names that we use for our single vineyards also grow grapes for this. So even though this is our ADA wine, uh, really the, the big brother to our Sonoma Coast Chardonnay, again, this is made with the same quality of grapes and the same winemaking techniques that we use for all of our single vineyards. So this is not a second tier by any means. So um, what I love about Pinot Noir is that beautiful spicy nose. It's like a cross between some crazy spice box and chocolate and wet earth and, and sea breeze and Wow, very, very complex. Um, to my, one of the, my favorite things about Pinot Noir is that it can be floral, it can smell like carnations or dried roses without being particularly fruity. Um, there's fruit there, like maybe some cherry or cranberry, but it's much more complex and much more layered. And so this is a great wine to put into your cellar um, in three or four years. The tannins have softened, the aromas have gained a few more notches of complexity. Um, really worth putting in the cellar. So, James, we got two uh, cellar related questions. Okay. Uh, one from, from BMAC3034. Uh, what are some tips for beginners who are looking to buy an aged Pinot Noir? Hmm. Well, um, first, try a bunch and take some notes and go back and see what style you like. There's sort of the, the Mayomi style, which I would call uh, not very Pinot Noir-like. Uh, they label it as Pinot Noir, but it really drinks much more like a table wine, a red table wine. And then on the other extreme are wines from New Zealand or Burgundy, which tend to be much leaner, higher in acidity, um, much more mineral, not a lot of fruit, very, very tense. Um, maybe try some wines from Oregon, try some wines from Sonoma, a few producers, and um, through the different price categories. And then circle the ones you like, and then go out and um, buy a few of those. And if you find a wine you like, buy three or four or five, six bottles and put it into your cellar. And every six months or so, pull a bottle out and taste it. And if the wine is getting better, don't drink another wine for another six months. If it's tasting great, go and finish the, the case or the half case over the next few months. Um, one mistake a lot of people make is they buy too much wine in the beginning and not enough later. It's important to have a consistent buying strategy. So if you find producers you like and specific vineyards you like, buy a few bottles of that wine and then wait for the next year and buy a few more. Um, joining a wine club is a great way to uh, be exposed to a lot of the wines that you don't find in the retail market. If you find a producer you really like, the wine club's a great chance to uh, look behind the curtain and see some of the very limited production wines that they might produce. And try to come up with a list of 10 or 12 producers which you really like and then cherry pick and buy and build the collection. 
Um, the mistake I see a lot of people make is they spend too much money in the beginning on very expensive wines that they're then afraid to drink. They feel like they've invested too much and you know Wednesday night's not good enough for a William Sully and Pino. You want to make sure that you buy wines for drinking, not for collecting. So um, it's sometimes it's better to buy two bottles of something that's less expensive as opposed to some big trophy. Personally, I love pulling the trophies out, um, but I have to be careful about buying too many of them. So you want a nice selection and not too many trophies, not too many Wednesdays. So it's a long answer. <laughs> and, and then a second related question from World Wine Guy, Worldwide Wine Guy. Uh, is there a rule of thumb to determining a wine's ability to improve with age? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, yes, there are some objective standards. Uh, one is the elusive balance. You want to have the correct ratios between acidity and tannin. Um, color can also help you know, determine whether it's got the ability to age. Um, but certain wines seem to be immortal and other wines that you think would age forever fall short. There is definitely a sense of mystery around uh, which wines age and which ones don't. Um, of course, tasting older vintages and reading about particular estates, you can glean perhaps which ones um, were intended to, to age a long time. Uh, I do caution people not to age their wines too long. Um, I get asked a question at every tasting, uh, how long should I keep this wine? I prefer to drink wines after three or four or five years. If you keep it 10 years, that's great. But remember, that's 10 years of time in your cellar that you might have been able to put two wines in that spot instead of one. And also, at the end of 10, is it really going to be a better wine than it would have been in five? Sometimes yes, oftentimes no. Um, and I, I see a lot of people um, aging their wines too long. So, so keep it fresh, don't be afraid to open the bottles. Um, and if you open a wine and don't drink the whole bottle, one great indicator is if it tastes good the next day. If the wine um, is still fresh and vibrant and fruity and delicious the next morning, or <laughs> I don't do much morning drinking, huh? but <laughs> next afternoon, <laughs> evening, that's a good indication that it's going to age because of course it's been in the low bottle all night. So that's kind of rapid aging right there. So if you were thinking about buying a case of wine, just leave a little two fingers in the bottom and taste it the next day and see if you like it better. If you do, it's worth aging. Cool, so uh, I love this pace because uh, I'm a fast drinker normally. Wow, I like that Sonoma Coast. So um, the last wine we're gonna drink, um, even though this is only a fraction of the wines that we make, we had to, we had to pick something. So, um, this is Gap's Crown Vineyard. So Gap's Crown Vineyard is located in the Sonoma Coast. Um, now most people think Sonoma Coast is very, very close to the ocean, but at one point it swings over and extends to the eastern side of Highway 101. Now, this rule says the further away from the ocean, the warmer it is. However, this vineyard is high enough on the hill that the wind comes directly off the ocean and hits it. This is on the lower flank of Sonoma Mountain, which is one of the windiest spots in all of Sonoma. So Gap's Crown has this uh, particular advantage where it's sloped to the west, so it gets lots of sun, but the wind strike through the Petaluma Gap keeps this vineyard very, very cold. Uh, that's why it's called Gap's Crown, because it crowns the gap. So uh, this vineyard is owned by Bill Price III, who also owns Three Sticks. Uh, an awesome viticulturist and um, all around terrific guy. Great wine aficionado, and he's put his heart and soul into managing this vineyard to the very, very top level. Um, I've been making a single vineyard wine from this since 2007, and um, I don't know if I wanna tell you this, but I think we have the best block at Gap's Crown. Don't listen, Bill, because you, I, I, you have enough grapes from Gap's Crown for your brand, you don't need mine, but it is the best block. Um, it's planted to a Dijon selection of Pinot Noir, uh, Clone 667. Um, this is a particularly small, buried, intense uh, Pinot Noir clone. It tends to make a wine that is very tannic, very full-bodied. This wine does need some age. When we released this wine, 
it can often be a little primary and a bit young. Um, a couple of years in the cellar to round the corners off is, is well rewarded. Um, this wine also is very curious and it's got sort of a fine herb um, note to it that reminds me a little bit of tarragon. Um, there's a, a phrase in French where um, they talk about wines from the south of France and how they smell like sage. Um, and so this wine seems to have a little bit of that where it's fruity and spicy, almost like root beer, but then there's this interesting sort of weaving little green note that reminds me kind of of like the stem on a rose or something. Um, very unique to Cap's Crown. One of the things about bottling single vineyards is that they need to have a real sense of personality in place. So I don't wanna have wines that are just kind of like, oh well, that's clone 667 and this one's clone 828. They really have to taste different. And this is one of the most unique in the portfolio um, and tends to be very powerful. Um, goes great with more robust foods. Um, a Florentine T-bone steak is like bloody perfect for this. Um, get one of those big three inch thick things and uh, I love that. James, we got a question in from the Clarks. Um, you know, what are the major differences between Sonoma and Napa Pinot Noir? Hmm. Well, very little Pinot Noir uh, is grown in Napa except for sparkling wine. So most of the Pinot Noir in Napa is grown in Carneros region, with a few exceptions. Um, there's some uh, grown further up valley and some of it can be very, very fine. Some of the mountaintops like uh, Sonoma Mountain, or excuse me, uh, Spring Mountain and Howell Mountain, um, there's little patches of Pinot. Most of it, however, is in the very southern part next to San Francisco Bay where it's the coolest. Um, the cold water, you know, works in San Pablo Bay, just like it does on the Pacific. Um, so most of the Pinot in Carneros was originally planted for sparkling wine. And there really are two different selections of Pinot. For sparkling wine, you want very large clusters. Uh, you want a lot of fruit uh, and very, very high acidity and marginal ripeness. You want the, the grapes really to be underripe. And so you pick very specific selections to make sparkling wine. So um, trying to make still or table wine out of those grapes can be a bit of a challenge. There's some wonderful wines in Carneros. Uh, Hyde Vineyards I produce. Um, one of my favorite Pinot Noirs, Hyde Vineyards is a knockout. I happen to live in Carneros uh, on the Napa side and I live at a vineyard called Moses Hall. And um, I love the wine, not just because I live there, actually I've been harder on that vineyard probably than most, Be um, but there's some really nice uh, Pinot Noirs in Carneros. Now Sonoma, um, there's Pinot from Carneros on the Sonoma side, uh, Sonoma Valley, Sonoma Coast, uh, Petaluma Gap, Russian River, um, Chalk Hill, and each area tends to have its own particular set of flavors and aromas. Um, particularly if you, if you buy wines from small uh, family-run businesses where generally what's in the bottle is a single vineyard. So um, the differences tend to be Sonoma has a bit more acidity uh, than Carneros and the wines tend to be a little more floral and fruity. To my mind, Carneros makes uh, uh, wines that are a little um, heavier and slightly more tannic uh, and tend to be a bit more spicy um, and complex, earthy licorice. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Jill, uh, we have Jill here who's asking, um, can you kind of share your uh, philosophy or, or approach uh, on magnums? Mag there's an old, an old joke. Magnums are the perfect size for you and your wife when your wife's not drinking. The, it is the perfect shape for aging wines. Um, those of you familiar with uh, aging champagne, everyone is seriously into magnums. There's something about a magnum, uh, the volume of the bottle to the cork, the ratio invariably lets the wine age much longer than a 750. Um, it's my favorite size bottle. Um, and if there's a chance to uh, try a wine that's 10 or 12 or 15 years old out of Magnum, hell yes, that's the way to go. Um, I think a lot of people misunderstand Magnums as being too much and 
oh my God, there's eight of us, but you know, it's a Magnum. Well, it's only two bottles of wine. <laughs> and um, a typical bottle of wine gives you about five glasses. So if you wanted to have, you know, a glass and a half each, open a Magnum. Uh, see, Jessica here is asking, uh, did you always know that you wanted to be a winemaker? No, no, I didn't. Um, I was uh, an anthropology major at UC Santa Cruz, and I was working at a real high-end restaurant named Hillary's, and it was during a, a food uh, phase called um, Nouvelle Cuisine, which was an excuse for lots of knives and forks and small portions. But what the restaurant did have was a great wine list. So it had vintage champagne, it had Grand Cru Burgundy, it had first growth Bordeaux, it had um, a great list of California iconic producers. And so this was 1979. And so um, as, as I started to be exposed to some of these wines, um, I realized how fascinating it was to smell them and try them with food. And it never occurred to me that that's something I could do as a career. And as I started um, into the end of my sophomore year, um, I had a little heart-to-heart -heart talk with my father about how I wasn't really jazzed to be an anthropology major. And he reminded me of the fact that if you're a, a UC student, you can transfer between UC campuses and they give you preferential admission. So I went to the library and I pulled all the catalogs of all the UCs out and I pulled the UC Davis catalog out and I flipped to the section of food science and realized there was something called a viticulture and enology degree. I almost fell out of my chair. It's like, you mean you can get a degree in viticulture and enology? Yes. So transferred to UC Davis, attended the program, um, and that's what really launched me on being a winemaker. Um, I, I absolutely love my job. It is, it is so much fun. Um, and it's a lot of hard work, but certainly glad I made the change. We got another question um, about the 2019 vintage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are your thoughts on it? And in particular, uh, you know, were there any impacts from any sort of fires? So um, 19 turned out to be a very good vintage. Um, you know, 17, we had uh, the devastating fires that, that were you know, so traumatic for many, but um, all of our grapes were picked in 17 before the fires came in October. Um, so from a winemaking point of view, our wine saw none of that impact, even though emotionally it was horrific. Um, 18, uh, there was a lot of smoke, but again, all of our grapes were in the barn. So 17 and 18 were really very, very smoky in the fall. Um, some of the late Cabernet producers, particularly the ones on Howell Mountain or Mount Beater that really struggled to get their grapes ripe even in a, in a normal year, might have faced some problems. But it's very hit and miss. 19 was a solid year. We had a very wet winter, so everyone was jazzed by the fact that we had lots of rain and snow. Um, you know, really, I want to say record for the last five years, but records need numbers. I just know it was a lot. So um, the vineyards were luxuriant with cover crop and grasses, and the vines grew very, very well. They were, they were clearly loving it. Um, and then we had a series of warm uh, events, but towards harvest, things cooled down, and it was a very orderly, calm vintage. So uh, I hesitate to characterize the vintage as being kind of low stress, because it's never low stress, but everything went really smoothly. Um, the only problem with the 19s is that we're gonna sell them during these challenging times, and I don't know what the economics are gonna look like, but the wines are terrific. James, we got a question from Steve um, about the grapes behind you. Mm -hmm. um, where did the grapes from uh, that vineyard go? This is one of my favorite blocks of grapes because when we open the tasting room here, uh, I wanted to have a little vineyard experience where we could take people out in the vineyard and show them all the different clones of Chardonnay. So what's right behind me is a library block and I've taken cuttings from almost every vineyard that I make Chardonnay from and planted them in rows. 
And so you can see the difference between Hyde Wente and Clone 809 and Robert Young and Clone 76, etc. Now, we haven't developed that program, so if you come here, please don't ask to go see the vineyard because um, our legal team said, oh my God, you can't take people into the vineyard. They're gonna stub their toe, and oh my goodness. But, so that block, I've spent months and months trying to get all these different selections in there. So thanks for the shout out because that's the only time anyone's ever gonna hear that this is a library block and how cool it is. So thanks for the question. James, next question. Uh, would you describe Passon Hall as more of a new world or uh, old world style of winery? Hmm. Well, um, old world sensibility, new world functionality. Old world, um, in this sense, respect for the terroir and the vineyard, the um, belief that a great vineyard does not need a lot of winemaking that it's more of a shepherding, it's more of a, of a, of a helping process. It is not a, it's not like, you know, you're not a sculptor, you're not making the wine, you're helping the wine make itself. Um, also the belief um, that wines can age when they're properly made. Um, my wines age really, really well, and that's certainly a, a standard which is extremely important uh, in the old world. Um, new world wise, um, I believe in science and I use um, lab work to look at the wines. I taste a lot, but also viticulturally. Um, we're at a really interesting time in Sonoma because we've, um, we've grown so quickly here. Um, the Pinot Noir business in Sonoma is less than 50 years old. So what uh, a lot of people in Sonoma have done is drawn from different viticultural traditions all over the world and, um, and synthesized it into a particular kind of California style of growing grapes. So um, in that sense, we're very new world. We're willing to adopt other people's practices. Um, after all, you know, classic um, traditions at one point were innovations. Um, we don't make wines the way the Romans used to. Um, and so I believe that getting the innovation balanced with the tradition is the key to making a great wine. So the wines are very New World style. They're fruity. They're, they have what I would consider, um, you know, that precocious New World like ability. Um, but I also travel to Burgundy a bit and take them and pour them for people in Burgundy and they like them. And so I think there's a universal nature to, to some of these wines. So I guess it's kind of a foot in each camp. James, we've got actually several questions here asking about the Oak program. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about um, your Oak program and kind of explain your, your seasoning process for the barrels? One of my, so barrels, all the wines are aged in French oak barrels. I alluded to this earlier. Um, we buy barrels from, from various coopers. Um, and they're all burgundy coopers. Um, but where the trees are grown is very important. Um, the typical uh, tree for a French oak barrel is grown in a government controlled wood forest um, controlled by the French government, planted by Napoleon III. So most of the trees are between 100 and 150 years old. They're very sustainable. Um, they have an, a very elaborate system for how they manage their forest. And so um, there's more French oak trees growing now than there were in the 50s. Um, and so the French have taken this very, very seriously. So I wanna buy barrels from sustainable forest that are well maintained. The other uh, thing about a barrel is how the wood is seasoned. So um, when you cut down a tree and you, you form the stave, um, it's a very square piece of wood and you can't make a barrel out of that until it's been seasoned. And so the minimum time you can season a stave and have the barrel um, actually um, taste decent and, and can be formed and bent into a barrel is about a year. Most coopers would age their wood for approximately 18 months. And during that seasoning, there's rainfall, there's sun, there's microbes growing on the wood. The wood um, leaches out a lot of the harsh, dry tannins um, 
that make the wood taste very planky and raw. Um, you know, that would be sort of what you'd get out of a bourbon, you know, that real aggressive oak quality. But then you can go another step where you can season the wood for three or four years. So all of the barrels I work with have had the wood seasoned for three years. So that's a very large financial commitment because now we have this wood that is sitting in the Cooper's yard for another 18 months. Um, and that's capital that is, that is not turning. So um, one of the things we've done is we've helped the Coopers um, keep that wood for us by buying the wood ahead of time. So in the case of Francois Frere, uh, our biggest cooper and one of the most important in all of France and particularly Burgundy. Um, we purchase wood uh, after it's been cut into staves. We then uh, age the wood at Francois Frere's cooperage in Saint Romain, um, Burgundy, Cote d'Or. Um, and then the barrels are made out of the wood that we purchased before. So that means we have more control over the seasoning process, the grain selection. Um, etc. So um, the, the whole point is to try to make a very consistent barrel, one that has the necessary elements to meld with wine. So it has to have enough tannin to support the tannin structure, not be too aggressively oaky or dry or, or smoky, um, and to uh, integrate into the wine. So barrels are very important, but it's still the picture not it, the frame, not the pitcher, is what I'm trying to say. Um, wines that are over oaked, um, you know, to me it's like uh, if it, it's, it doesn't work. Uh, oak has to be balanced. So I'm very fussy about the barrels and I spend a lot of time tasting and meeting with Coopers and talking about how we can nudge a particular character out of a Cooperage. Maybe it means another 15 minutes of toasting. Maybe it means putting a lid on the top. Maybe it means squirting the barrel down with water halfway through. Um, there's a bunch of little micro techniques that bring out the best in a Cooper barrel. And so I'm still very interested and fascinated by uh, how that works. So yeah, good question. Barrels are very important. And uh, how many times can you use a barrel? I've got a question here. Well, uh, you can keep barrels for dozens of years, decades. Uh, we keep barrels for three years. Um, so most of the wine um, sees new oak, all the wine sees new oak. Um, and it's a, a matter of percentage. Some of the, like Pozzoni Vineyards is 70% new oak. Uh, the Gaps Crown is 50% new oak. Uh, the Sonoma Coast Chardonnay is a little less than a third. So as those new barrels match up to the wine, we use the next uh, youngest barrels in the mix and um, three years later, we sell those barrels. So those barrels go to another winery and they're used another three or four years. So, um, you know, it's a tough question, but the barrels themselves will hold liquid so long as they're well-maintained and kept in a, in a cool cellar for decades. All right, we'll uh, wrap up with a few lighthearted questions. <laughs> um, what do you enjoy drinking other than wine? Mm, beer. <laughs> um, there's a brewery here called Russian River uh, Brewing Company. Uh, there's a, a couple of beers they make I love. Uh, there's a new brewery in Petaluma called Hen House, which is making some terrific um, beers. Um, some hazy, a little less tan or a little less um, hoppy than some of the Russian River stuff. So I really like beer. Um, I used to brew beer in college until I realized I could buy better beer for half the cost and it didn't ruin my weekend. So um, beer, um, champagne, I really, really like sparkling wine. Uh, and if you come to the Sonoma house, we're gonna give you a little sparkling wine treat. Um, I've been making sparkling wine since 2013, very much incognito um, on the lowdown here. So um, you, you can't really buy it unless you come here, uh, but you get to taste it first. <laughs> Um, and then a good friend of mine has a bar in his living room and he's always making cocktails. So, uh, for instance, I, we hung out on his deck like five days ago and he made this cocktail called the Ides, Ides of March, which was made with blood oranges and a Amaro. It was fantastic. So, um, I think the list of things I don't like to drink is much shorter. <laughs> I mean, sake, um, 
really, I don't know much about it, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, you know, a different fermentation process. So, I don't know. We can... And, and what, what would be your uh, Desert Island Patson Hall wine? Oh, do I have to pick one? Just one. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Magnums only, of course. Um, huh. Now, Desert Island, that means there's probably going to be a lot of fish. I'm going to have to go Chardonnay, I think. Just because, you know, there's probably going to be some coconuts. I'm sort of envisioning sort of like a, maybe like a fish over the barbie with some sort of coconut uh, sauce. So I'm, I would go Hyde Vineyard for that. Um, maybe Dutton Ranch. Um, a Magnum might not be big enough. I maybe I'd need a three liter. Because, you know, if I'm stranded there for a long time, I could maybe lash those together into a raft or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't think I'm going to have enough wine. Yeah. I'm almost sure. <laughs> and then uh, we got a question from Ron through Instagram uh, stories. If there is a bear between you and your uh, wine, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> uh, run the other direction. I know the bear doesn't have a corkscrew. It'll be there later. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, thanks for joining me. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and please come and visit us. And... Um, We've got a few, you know, super secret surprises. When we open back up, we're going to have our new vintage of rosé. Um, I'm disgorging more sparkling wine next month. Um, there's new releases of your favorite wines. So there's always a good reason to come and visit. Besides, it's absolutely gorgeous. So um, I hope uh, all of these COVID times wrap up and we can get back to hosting you all here. And I uh, really look forward to seeing you at the Sonoma House. So cheers for now. Bye-bye.